Hello, everybody. My name is Christopher Scafidi. Uh, thanks for joining us virtually and in person for our second TechU uh, meeting this spring. We are going to get started. Just uh, I'm going to do some housekeeping real quick, just tell you what the night's going to look like, and then we will hear from some other people. So for starters, um, if you're online, just remember you can ask questions at any time in the chat. We will have someone monitoring those questions that they will be able to um, ask when it's appropriate to ask them. Not all the questions are going to get answered tonight, but it is going to be recorded. Um, and so you'll be able to look back. And then uh, next, in about two weeks on April 12th, we're going to have another um, question and answer format where you can ask more of those questions if you'd like to. Um, so I'm going to give just a little bit of uh, information about me and my experience with technology. And then we're going to turn over to the student council. They have some information to share. Um, and then Mr. Ott is going to come up. He's going to share his wisdom with us just about technology and how we can handle that and grow that relationship with technology, opposed to just building a bunch of rules around the technology. Um, so if you know me, I'm Christopher. I graduated last year, so I'm not actually a part of the MHSAP anymore or the student council. Um, Ms. Ra asked me to join you guys tonight to kind of MC and host this event, uh, just because we're talking about like preteens through like teenagers and their experience and relationships with technology. I am one of the very first generations who really grew up completely with technology and have spent all my teenage years having some sort of device in my pocket. So we just felt like I might have some information um, and I can just appreciate the struggles that teenagers are going through. So just about my personal like experience with technology, I remember I was probably six or seven when my dad brought home the iPod first generation um, and just that crazy um, revelation of being able to touch something with your finger. You didn't need a special pen to write. You could just touch a screen and it'd like respond. That was like the equivalent of my dad walking home with a time machine and calling me Marty McFly. Like it was ridiculous. Um, and of course I thought that was like peak technology, you know? Of course, looking back at an iPod first generation today, I put it in the same category as a sundial. Like it doesn't really do anything anymore. <laughs> um, but at the time it was insane. And then rapidly I saw more and more devices like that filling up my house. So then my mom got one and then my older brother was old enough to get one. And I got so used to it so quickly. Um, I was probably 11 when I saved up enough money to buy myself one. And at that point there was the fourth generation iPod where I could take photos and post those photos online and see what other people were posting. And as an 11 year old, that was crazy because I could compare myself to other people and you see like the dangers of that. Um, and not only was able to compare my life and my looks and my personality with others, I could also just get access to just about anything I wanted to. I could learn about just about anything that I wanted to and that was beautiful, but super dangerous, excuse me, super dangerous. And I just remember um, I was probably 12 years old when I was like way later than I should have been on my phone. And I walked to my parents' room like, you should take this. It's too much for me. And you should just like sell it. Um, and of course, <laughs> I have a phone now. So <laughs> that resolve didn't last long. But, you know, even as a 12 year old, I was able to see that that's a lot of information and power to give a kid. And of course, my relationship with technology um, had its ups and its downs um, as I've been a teenager in my life. You know, my parents tried all sorts of different rules and um, apps that you can get to monitor your phone to just like keep us safe from the dangers of the internet. Uh, well, acknowledging that having a phone in this day and age is almost like a necessity. So they knew that, you know, we, they wanted us to have phones, but they wanted us to be safe and be protected. And so that's just sort of what tonight's gonna to be about is talking to uh, real life teenagers who all have phones, who all have those uh, same uh, availabilities to everything on the internet and how can we grow that relationship with technology opposed to just building rules because each person is different um, and you're never gonna find one solid rule as Mr. Ah will talk about, it's gonna be a relationship that we need to build. So. In a minute, you're gonna have the ability to hear from Mr. Ott and then ask questions of Mr. Ott or of our student council panel. 
Um, these questions can be anything involving technology or questions you wish your kids would know, um, or and the students would just be able to respond to those. Before Mr. Ott comes up, we are going to hand it over to the student council, and they're just going to take a minute and read you just some statistics about uh, technology, and then Mr. Ott will come up and speak. Okay. It's not just the kids. The majority of families bring their phones to dinner, to the dinner table. From the Barna survey, 64%. However, nearly half the respondents, 47%, Say they wish their families spent more time together and less time on their device. Teens are usually aware of the issues technology presents in their lives. Sociologist Donna Frieda's survey of college students found that a majority of students have tried to quit social media and many more have tried to curb their use of it. High school students relate to this as well. Of the 1,154 participants ages 13 to 21, more than half, 53%, say they procrastinate doing homework or other things because of technology. They also blame technology for feeling more distracted, 50%, and less productive, 36%, for wasting a lot of time, 54%, and for shortening their attention span, 80%. Technology offers not just a distraction from school, but from real pain as well. Some of the survey respondents suffer from suicidal thoughts, 33%, depression, 30%, self-hatred, 19%, and more. These responses were more common for those whose screen time is more than eight hours a day. In the final survey of, American, of Americans ages 13 to 21, Nearly three quarters of the respondents, 72%, say technology has made their life easier because it gives them access to so much information. 64% says tech makes life easier by helping people feel closer to friends and family. On the flip side, 32% say that the difficulty they have with technology is the way it separates them from other people. In general, Respondents feel more positively than negatively towards the effect of technology on their lives, but are aware that the benefits come at a cost. Awesome. Thank you guys. All right. Now I'm going to invite Jim Ott to come up and give some information just on how, as parents and students, we can grow that relationship with technology. Oh, you have yours. Yes. All right. Thanks for you guys. That was really good. I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, my name is Jim Ott. Thank you very much. I'm uh, kind of a, what, what am I? I'm a Marion Homeschool Assistance Program adjunct professor of student council. I don't actually teach, but I've been working with the student council kids for the last couple of years, and it's such a thrill. And I just want to say this I love your kids. And I know I don't know all the kids that vote, but all the kids I've met um, at, at the student council and in the homeschool, I'm just, it's been a delight. And I appreciate the privilege of working in this place and working with the kids. Uh, my background, for those uh, who have never seen me or heard of me before, I was a school psychologist with an area of education agency, not locally, but uh, in eastern Iowa, for 35 years. And then, thanks to the wonders of early retirement incentives, I pulled away from that job and been doing miscellaneous consulting with schools and communities on things related to mental health and some other issues as well. So uh, I got connected with the uh, MH, what's it called, MISH, HAP, MISH, what, what is it? MH SAP. MH SAP, no, MH SAP. Anyway, uh, last year, helping to set up a student council so that students could kind of take some ownership of the conversation regarding things like mental health and what we're doing here tonight, the tech thing. Our hope is to increase that over time, to increase the influence and increase the opportunity for students to be a part of the conversation. Uh, I appreciated the stats. I like that the stats indicate that, that there are some positives as well as some negatives. And the reality is, as with all things, tech itself is not evil. It's what people do with tech that creates the problem. And so this isn't about, and I want to introduce it by saying this, this is not about what's right or what's wrong with tech or where the boundaries are, where the lines are. It's about being aware that like many other things, 
tech is a tool that can be used for good and it can also be corrupted. And this isn't about like parents, if you're here and you're thinking and you're listening and you're thinking, oh, fine, I'm going to have some good information to smack your kid with, that ain't going to happen tonight. So don't be looking for that. On the other hand, kids, if you think I'm going to say, fine, my parents let me do whatever I want on the phone, that's nonsense. That ain't happening either. So we need to really talk about where's the balance? Where is it that families can actually deal with this issue of technology in a healthy way? And that's what we're going to try and run through. Now, my hope is to, I'm not going to get into a lot of the weeds here tonight just because we don't have time to do that and have an appropriate conversation if you'd like to have. But I do want to summarize just a few things that I've learned and I've studied and heard about and that I've seen in my own experience watching kids grow up with tech. So one of the things we want to, we want to notice is that um, this in the year 2007 was the release of the iPhone. The iPhone was the first smartphone as we understand smartphones. Prior to that, the internet was kind of a problem, but you had to go sit someplace to get to the internet. You couldn't necessarily access all the things that we could access. But then the iPhone came, and we all know that Steve Jobs was brilliant. He designed tech that was appealing. The, the iPod, the original iPod was kind of oh, this is so cool. I remember that. And you could spin around the little dial thing. This is so cool. All right, when the iPhone came, everything changed because now you did not have to go someplace to access the internet. The internet was with you. And the things that have changed in those 15 years since then, 14 years, are really beyond compare. Like, it's not the same. And the kids that we're talking about tonight, teenagers, are really the first, the front end of the first generation that is growing up in a world where they've never known not smartphones. Whether they had one or not, they've always seen them. They've always been there. And this is a super important point. People grow up in the context in which they grow up. They don't grow up in the 60s when it's the 22s, okay? Or what are we, the 21s? What do you see here? 21. You guys are 21? Why are you still in high school? Sorry, this is a joke. Right, and, and sometimes parents get confused about this because we, we actually think that there's something wrong with the context. There's always been something wrong with the context, always. And that's an important point. But this is the first generation of kids and especially the ones that we talked about last month, the birth to 12 year olds, no access to a world where the smartphone was introduced. Some of these kids can remember when that started happening, but the kids from last month, the birth to 12 year olds, They'll never know. As far as they know, smartphones are part of the landscape. And so we're never going back to a time when that's not going to be true. The question is, what do we do about it? Now, the problem is that many parents today are worried, stressed, scared, nervous, anxious, really, in many ways, fearful about tech and the impact it can have on their kids. And this is the other thing I like to say to parents, and I hope you guys will be okay with this, and usually the students are okay with these things. You guys, your parents, have absolutely no idea what you're doing. Like, no idea what you're doing. And a lot of kids are like, I knew that, I could have told you that. Let me explain why you have no idea what you're doing. There are two main reasons that as parents related to tech, you have no idea what you're doing. Number one, there is no intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So many, many years, let's go back 100 years, when parents had kids, those kids grew up and became parents, they could go to their parents and say, what do we do about this situation? How do we handle this situation? And for the most part, life was pretty much the same generation to generation. The speed of change was very slow. But now we have parents of kids who have no adults that they can go to and say, what's it like to raise a kid with this? It doesn't exist. It's not the same as when I was a kid. My parents got me Hot Wheels. All right, Hot Wheels were cool. They were brand new. It's not funny, just because I'm old. All right, but Hot Wheels was a really cool thing. And I was alive when Hot Wheels were first in the stores. My parents went and got it for me. Why not? Most parents want their kids to have the best and the newest, but that didn't have the same impact on me as tech does. And so, my kids, when they have kids, will not be able to come to me even and say, what do you do with tech? 
So we need to acknowledge without the intergenerational transfer of knowledge, it's difficult to know what you're doing. And number one, that's okay. It's okay. The problem is that fear <laughs> takes us to, to, to places of action that maybe we want to, want to reconsider. And hopefully we can talk about that. The second thing that is really, really important is that in spite of all the things that you may read, there is no longitudinal data. There's no research that they can say, over the last 20 years, we've studied kids with smartphones, and this is what happens to them when they're 40. That doesn't exist. And there's conflicting data out there. Now, I, I can know some things just in sort of instinctively, and you can figure these things out too. But the reality is that some of the data is really correlational more than it is causational. In other words, we don't really know, are the times creating the mental health challenges that lead kids to use tech more, or is tech creating the mental health challenges that like, which one's causing the other? And actually that's not super clear in the research yet. The trend would seem to say that the more you're immersed in this world, the less likely you're able to navigate the real world but that's a diff, slightly different topic to talk about. So there's no research and you don't have anybody to talk to. So you have no idea what you're doing as parents. It's okay, let's acknowledge that. And then let's toss this one out. It's not just the kids that are having trouble with the addictive nature of, an, of, of smartphones. So I there really need some, a whole bunch of interesting data on this, but one of the uh, references that I'll, I'll mention, and the kids borrowed some stats from that, um, and this is out of Barna. So Andy Crouch, there you go. Andy Crouch wrote a book called The Tech Wise Life, uh, Tech Wise Family, and it's about how his family dealt with tech. Now, I'm going to lie to you, it's pretty radical. They got some pretty radical stuff in terms of the restrictions that they had on tech. They didn't get it perfect. And then his daughter wrote this when she was 19. This is just last year, so it's a very recent book. These two books dive into text with Barna research. Um, but among the interesting things uh, that I found in the research from the TechWise family is that um, the average family eats together six times a week. And then they were asked, they asked the parents, are, are the kids allowed to bring their devices to the table? Are you or the kids? 46%, and in, in the stat over here, it was 60%. It's a slightly different question. But a lot of people are bringing devices to the table. Are, and then they ask this, are your, do your children text or call or do something else on their phones at the dinner table? And the, the parents said that happened often or sometimes 27% of the time. Tracking? You got a family, you got kids. About a quarter of the time, kids are using their phone. Not all kids, but about a quarter of the kids are using their phone or doing something. Sometimes or often. But then they asked the same question about the parents and the same group of parents said, for the parents, it was 45% of the time. So parents are having their phone struggles with the tech. All, like, it's almost like, and some of you guys might even recognize this. It's like, don't you do that. Hold on, I gotta answer this. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta get this text. Well, this is work. Well, this is important. Oh, well, this is my mom, whatever. It's like, don't you do this. And there's quite a bit of data about how parents also, adults are also struggling with the addictive nature of text. So we just gotta be aware of that. It's okay, but we need to be aware of it. So here's the problem. Parents don't know what they're doing. There isn't good data. This freaks parents out because they've heard all the stories about all the stuff that happens. And there's a lot of nonsense out there. We did our own survey. I'm not sure I'm going to get to a lot of that survey of students in the homeschool program. I may get to some of that tonight. We'll see how our time goes. But parents are extremely worried and scared. And here's what happens when human beings, okay, this isn't just about parents, but parents trying to protect their children, trying to deal with a threat. When human beings get freaked out, they get stressed. Okay, we don't get smarter, okay? How many of you guys know this? Do you do your best work when you're under stress, like perpetual chronic stress, you're really panicked? No, we freak out, okay? Human beings don't do their best work under stress. And when it comes to tech, if you can apply it here, what happens is human beings, when they are stressed, will often go either to legalism, 
which is, all right, we have some rules now, let's put smack down, we're gonna get some rules, and you better follow those rules, or if you don't follow those rules, and they become very legalistic, super legalistic, and if I wanna say it, they try to over control something that they're freaked out about. If they don't go to legalism, then they go to fatalism, which is basically saying, wow, this is just like, oh, it's too big, and there's just too much going on, and, and maybe if I just don't pay any attention at all, just kind of go away, and everything will be okay. And so you have these two poles, legalism, which is rules, 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 that doesn't work very well in case you've tried it, or fatalism, which is kind of like, there's nothing to do about it anyway, and I mean, I can't, you know, I can't, you know, what am I going to do, and maybe if I just ignore it, it'll go away. Neither of those work. Over control, under control. What we're looking for is self-control, right? We're looking for self-control. And self-control is, is dealing with this issue. It's not about having a right relationship with tech versus a wrong relationship with tech. It's about having a healthy relationship with tech. To be able to have the resources to self-assess to self-monitor, to know where to go when you run into things that you, you know, like little 12 year old Christopher, oh, the phone's taking me over. Okay, like, do you know where to go when things happen? And so the, the healthy relationship can, te with tech can happen, but it's gonna happen, parent and child, through conversation, almost never through confrontation. Confrontation over tech, often comes when kids do something, see something, trip into something that they shouldn't have. And it freaks parents out. And there's nothing a kid likes better than a freaked out parent. I'm just gonna tell you, if you don't know that, a freaked out parent basically says to kids, especially younger kids, but even as you get older, I don't actually know who's in charge here. I don't know. And if I don't know who's in charge, I'm number one, more insecure about my environment. And number two, I better not tell my parents what's up because what if they lose it again? And so we have to be aware that if we go to confrontation, it's often gonna create division. I read one study that said that the impact on the mental health of teenagers is greater because of conflicts about tech than about tech itself. Does that make sense? Like we're fighting about the tech and that's actually creating insecurity in me more so than anything that tech all by itself is doing. So we just gotta be aware that this is about building relationship and having conversation about this that has a, a, a sense of mutuality. Yes, parents have to be in charge. It's your job to be in charge, but your job is also to prepare your teenagers to be adults. And to do that, this issue with tech, and this is something I probably shouldn't say, but I'll just lay it right out. They know a lot more about it than you do. If you're a parent, they know a lot more about it than you do. And when we try to control what we don't know, we end up creating division. And so we have to have a conversation where the kids are actively engaged and feel like their contributions matter. I'm gonna throw a couple of, uh, just a little bit of information, probably more than I should, but I like the sound of my voice. Okay, um, by the way, there's Little Debbie's in the back. Those of you that weren't here, you didn't get Little Debbie's, but we got Little Debbie treats in the back. Next time, you'll know, April 12th. All right, I just wanna talk real quick about one of the, one of the questions uh, that really comes up a lot is like, what's it doing to my brain? And I'm going to give you a quick neurological lesson. This is so simple. And like, you don't even need to know this. When your brain is doing one thing, it's not doing anything else. Like, it's, like if you're doing this, you are not doing this or this. And brains develop and become stronger based on practice much the same way. This is weird. Much the same way that your physical body gets stronger based on the things that you do with it. If you don't use your physical body, it gets weaker. If you use your physical body, if you exercise, it gets stronger. You can do things physically based on practice. I didn't do it tonight, but in the last one, I juggled because I, I learned to juggle when I was a kid. Ah, juggling is a lot of fun. I could juggle right now. Who cares? It doesn't really mean anything, but the point is this. My brain was wired to learn how to juggle. 
Because of that, it's in there. But if you've never juggled and you stand up to try to juggle, you can't do it because your brain never did it before. Our brain gets stronger based on the things that we do. <clears throat> so this is really obvious. And again, for younger kids, this is really an issue right now. And especially in the COVID quarantine, this has been made a little bit worse because more and more people are indoors and they're not outdoors. But if you play, if your play is mostly with a screen, that you are not learning to navigate your physical world. And there's a lot of other things going on with this, especially in the area of executive functioning, which is a fancy word for, can you take care of yourself? Can you regulate yourself? Executive functioning has a lot to do with things like paying attention, being able to inhibit your impulse control, being able to change direction cognitively, like be, to think about this, but then if there's a new thing to be able to switch direction. And if you don't practice those things, you don't actually get good at them. Not because you lack morality, but because you're just not training your brain to do the right thing. So here's a book, another book I'll, I'll give you if you wanna dive into the early things. This is called The Shallows. It's written by a guy named Nicholas Carr. Um, he's a, a writer and a researcher. And he, he wrote this book, it's called the shallows, what the internet is doing to our brain. And he did it all about the neurological impact. Now, I want to be clear, this was, this was released in 2011, which means he did a lot of his research not on smartphones. This is sitting at a computer. And, and, this is, and he discovered, he started doing it because he discovered that he himself was having trouble paying attention. So you heard that as one of the stats. It interferes with my ability to pay attention. So this is a quote from that book. One thing is very clear. If knowing what we know today about the brain's plasticity, you were to set out to invent a medium that would rewire our mental circuits as quickly and as thoroughly as possible, you'd probably end up designing something that looks and works a lot like the internet. It's not just that we tend to use the net regularly, even obsessively. It's that the net delivers precisely the kind of sensory and cognitive stimuli, repetitive, intensive, interactive, addictive, that have been shown to result in strong and rapid alterations in brain circuits and functions. With the exception of alphabets and number systems, the net may well be the single most powerful mind altering technology that's ever come into general use. At the very least, it's the most powerful that has come along since the book. Ooh. Does it make sense? Here's the thing. What technology does, see, you guys, you guys, you guys understand this, right? The people that make these things and the apps and the social media and all the, the games, they know what they're doing. They're not idiots. And you've heard this before, right? Like if you're not, if you're not paying for something you're using on the internet, you're not a consumer, you're the product. These tech companies make their money based on how long they can keep you engaged on the screen. And they're brilliant. And what they do is they trigger that part of your brain that responds to quick stimulation, and then they find ways to put in patterns so that you keep coming back to the same kinds of things that attract you. It's, it's unbelievable, and it's amazing how good they are. But if you don't know that that's happening, what happens is you end up with needing that level of stimulation to stay engaged in the world. And when you don't have that level of stimulation, you begin to get restless. And in fact, the other word, the other word we use for that is, anybody wanna know what the, the technological term for, I'm just kind of restless because nothing's really happening right now. Anybody know what that's called? Boredom, right? Do you get bored? Now, if you've got kids or if you as an adult are like, oh, I'm just kind of bored. What that is, is it's a response to a lack of stimulation that you're used to. So if you can see that the net is just like boom, 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 your phone, bing, 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 bing. And remember, this is not about kids. This is about humans, okay? A lot of adults are having more trouble with this than the kids are because the kids were raised with it. Like this is just, they know this world and they get it. Not all of them have been able to break out of it and we have to help our kids and help ourselves understand the addictive nature of tech. But the reason it works is because it tings your brain with the things that draw attention to it. But if the internet's doing all the attention pain, you don't have to work at paying attention. And what happens is when you're not with the tech, your brain says, 
it's, and you start to actually get nervous. The word boredom, you just look this up, doesn't actually exist in the English language until the 1850s. And then it was only among wealthy people. <laughs> it was, you know, the little house on the prairie, man, the whole, it got cold. It was like 40 degrees and they're all winter long. And all they did is sit there and just like, man, read books. They couldn't do anything else. Pop and pay, you know, pop played the fiddle. And like, they had nothing. They did nothing for months at a time. And the word boredom was not in their vocabulary because it's what they were used to. We get bored when we overstimulate ourselves and then the stimulation is taken away. And do we live in a world whoo, where stimulation? Like we live in this, this thing, this sociological term we call the tyranny of the moment. And the tyranny of the moment just says, right now is the only thing that matters. I got to get here right now because right now, if I don't get here right now, no. and we get driven into the tyranny of the moment. You know this, like if you've ever tried to watch the news on television, if you watch cable news, like pick your kind, we're not taking sides here, this is not a political discussion. But if you watch cable news, you, you're not watching. you got some guy screaming at you, a strip going across, another picture down here, things flashing, ding, 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 ding. They want you to stay engaged and they're overstimulating you for the purpose of getting you to a comfort level where that becomes what you're used to. If you don't know that's happening, you can very quickly get addicted to the stimulation level. And so we have to be conscious of this. Boredom and anxiety absolutely go hand in hand. Because when you begin to get bored, you have a physiological reaction that gives you a sense of nervousness, like something's not right. This is not a moral problem. This is a realization that this stuff affects us neurologically. And so we have to be able to have self-control. We don't need to be told what to do. Nobody likes being told what to do. And the reality is people, once they're not told what to do, if they've just been resisting being told what to do, they haven't learned anything. We have to build conversation, not confrontation, about the realities of these things. We have to learn the information and we have to help ourselves as adults and the kids understand the impact of tech and be able to make the choices that need to be made for themselves. This is a very important thing. All right, so um, a couple other things, just toss this out. Uh, we also know that developmental, I hate to talk about developmental stages. I just want to be clear that whatever age that you are at, you are at a developmental stage. I'm at a developmental stage. It's called dying. No, I'm not, I'm not really good. But, but <laughs> sorry. No, I'll be here next week, I promise. It, like, at my age, I'm at a developmental stage. Okay? I'm at an age where I have to consider what was my life and did I accomplish what I wanted and is there anything else for me to do and am I full of regret for my past or have I come to some acceptance that my time is, you know, that's, that's a developmental stage. All humans are at a developmental stage. What you know about teenagers, you know this, is that teenagers' job right now is to establish an identity independent of their parents. Now it's not, that doesn't mean they don't love their parents. It doesn't mean they don't identify with their parents. It's just, they ain't gonna live with you forever. Like you don't even want that, right? Like I know it's COVID now, but wait, we're looking over at Christmas. He's like, please get me out of the house, please. Like I know COVID has caused a lot of people to have to live at home, but you don't want your kids living with you until they're 25. Like that's a joke in the culture. But in order to do that, the normal development of teenagers is to move through this time finding ways to be independent in thought, in choice, in what they do with their time and their energies. And yes, we have to guide them through that. But if we put the clamps on that too much, we inhibit the development of identity and we create an insecurity that gets worked out after they leave. Are you tracking with me? Like, this is a huge thing. We've got to be able to be in such good relationships with our kids. Like I, I did a college thing last week and I did this video and I interviewed this college girl and, she, and I said, what do, you, what do you think parents really need to know? And her answer was, you just gotta make sure your kids like you because they're gonna need to call somebody. I was like, wow, that was the most profound thing. Like all she could say was you gotta have a relationship. You gotta have the relationship. And she says she's seen kids and they just don't feel like they can even call their parents because of the stuff that they're dealing with at college. We have to prioritize relationship. And when it comes to tech then, that relationship become, becomes 
conversing about these boundaries, not having them dictated, involving kids in the conversation about what the appropriate boundaries are and where they're going to be. So um, there's a lot of stuff about the, uh, the like mental health and, and all that stuff related to tech. And I think it's legit. Like I've, I've talked with a lot of kids um, over these past few years about the issues related to tech. I, I don't think there's any question that a lot of kids feel very pressured by the, just what Christopher was saying, the, the comparison that's on social media, where you look at people and you say, I got to look like that, I got to be like that. Oh, he got this many likes, I got not that many likes. Like, there is a lot of data on social media that can really interfere with your sense of self. Now, that doesn't mean don't ever look at social media. It means you need to know that this is a real pressure. And you have to be able to be honest about that. You have to be honest about the impact on your neurology. And you have to be on tech honest about the impact on your sense of self. Where does your strength come from? Where does your security come from? I, had, I had talked with a girl that was a senior in school this year, and, and she's somebody that I'd worked with before, and, and she told me about, um, she, like, she just turned her life around. I don't, I, there's a lot in this story, but she's a senior, and she said this, that she had, um, one of the things that really helped her, she gave up social media for a period of time. And then she, she said, I just added back Snapchat, mostly to communicate with people. This is what she said. She said, like all high school girls, I was really insecure. Um, seeing all these models and everything on social media led to comparison thinking. I was never good enough. Also, there's no real conversations or even relationships on social media. It's mostly just sending pictures to each other and gossiping. I'm so much happier and I'm dressing the way I want to dress. Before that, I had dressed the way everyone else from kindergarten all the way to my junior year, just like everybody else. I wish I would have figured this out before my senior year. That's not an unusual testimony from people who have gotten sucked into the comparison stuff that impacts your sense of self and your sense of identity. Again, this isn't a bad thing. This is a thing we have to be aware of. This isn't a, okay, no more social media for you, kid, because now you're gonna feel bad about yourself. Well, okay, now I just got rejected by my parents, that helps. Okay, like it's too, it's much more complex than that. In this book, um, if you want a book that really dives into some of the early data on what's called the, uh, she calls it the iGen, some people call it Gen Z or the internet generation. This is called iGen, it's written by a lady named Jean well, I don't know how you even pronounce it. Don't, don't, you know, edit this out. Twenji, I think her name is. Anyway, she had done a, a book on millennials. Um, sorry, I got distracted. I get distracted by them. Like, it's how you guys fault. All right. Um, she did a, a generational book on millennials, and then she did one on iGen. And this book is really uh, pretty incredible because what she did is she went back and looked at surveys that were given in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way through, and then found the same surveys given to people currently. So she's not just saying to a person like me, are you happy playing with Hot Wheels when you were eight years old? She's actually going back and finding surveys of eight-year-olds in the 60s and, and documenting, it's mostly with teenagers, I should say, and documenting some of the stuff that's going on. And she documents pretty clearly that there is definitely a decrease in the overall mental health since the internet and the, and the advent of smartphones. Like this is real stuff. But one of the things she did is she quoted a survey that said that, and this is correlation, not causation. They looked at just different activities that people do, that kids do. Every activity that did not involve a screen was correlated with happiness. In other words, if you were a happy kid, you were more likely to be happy. These activities predicted that you would be happy. It doesn't mean they caused it because you can't do it with this particular. So I don't want to go out and say, this is what you got to do. And every single screen-related activity was correlated with unhappiness. And there was no overlap, no exception. All right, that's one study. But we need to be aware that getting trapped inside of this thing can really impact our mental health, but we need to talk about it, not tell about it. So let me finish with this and then we'll get to the kids because we've got about 45 minutes and I'll give them a chance to chat. Um, the right work for kids to be doing is becoming independent of you. 
right? Like what you really want at this point is not a kid who uses social media want, right? You want a kid that when they're 25 years old, they still want to come over for dinner. Like I'm just going to lay that out. Like that's what you want. And yes, you want to navigate these waters, but you really want to put a lot of um, a lot of responsibility on kids for taking ownership of this themselves. You want to resist the culture of safetyism, which says we have to overprotect our kids from every evil thing that's out there, um, because that safetyism basically says it's someone else's decision to take care of you. That's not independent. <clears throat> and and um, I just want to make sure I got my notes right here. So here's the thing. These are not the days of my youth. And they're not the days as a parent. They're not the days of your youth. They are the days of their youth. This is the context in which they are living. There will never be a time when they look back and say, oh, I remember when there were no smartphones. This is life. This is the context. And so I don't know if this will work exactly, but I hope that this is helpful as a mental model, as a story. Tech today is a little bit like when I was a teenager and I wanted to wear bell-bottom jeans, have long hair, and listen to really loud rock and roll music. And this is the kids are like, what even is that? What are you talking about? These were the big, big, and they were really ugly jeans. And I've got pictures to prove how ugly they were. But at the time, it was the culture I was being raised in, and the music was different than my parents. My dad was a crew cut, never didn't went to work without a tie. Like he always very conservative in his dress. And you know, he listened to he listened to Willie Nelson when Willie Nelson had short hair. Come on, like this is a long time ago. Like, and and he, you know. But I wanted to be my own person. And so I would dress in these big jeans and have long hair. And my parents had a choice. They had a choice to judge me for my bell bottoms and long hair. But when they did that, it didn't feel like they were attacking bell bottoms and long hair. It felt like they were attacking me. Because when teenagers are in the process of establishing their own identity, and you go after something that is a part of their experience, it feels personal. Now you might not mean it that way. You might even say, no, I just have your best interests in mind. But when you attack the thing that is the most significant communication device that we've ever experienced in our human history, and it's a part of the natural flow of their lives, it's not a, it's not a bad or a good thing, it's just a thing, and you go after, like, the, even video games and some of these things, like, there are, some, there are some things on tech that are evil, but tech is not evil. But when you attack tech without relationship, it feels personal. Here's what kids need. Here's what you need. You need unconditional love. The absolute unconditional acceptance that no matter what, I'm here. You, kids need to be told that you are capable of making good choices. And what, in our surveys, you know, one of the things that came out, what would you say to parents is, when you grab, when you grab kids' phones, to, as a rule, okay, there are ways to do this negotiated, but you grab kids' phones and you just look through it, it's like saying, you don't trust me. Like, if there's no relationship and you're just diving into, you know, somebody's phone without even... There's no relationship. You're just saying, this is the rule. I can look at your phone anytime I want. I don't think that's a bad rule, but you need to sit down and negotiate how that is. And if I can be so bold, it needs to be mutual. Because parents have trouble too. There needs to be some kind of mutual accountability that will help everybody understand it's, we're all in this together. This isn't just about me telling you what's right and wrong. And then finally, kids need to know that no matter what happens, I'm gonna be here for you. You are not alone in this. I know so many kids, in fact, our survey, um, one of the questions we asked on our survey of Marion homeschool kids is, have you ever unintentionally ran into porn or sexually explicit material on, you know, on a device on the internet? And um, I think it was 70% uh, said yes. In fact, I better look it up so I don't mess this up. Uh-oh, if I can find the, uh, if I can find it. 70% said yes. Um, and 40% and 
when asked the question, when you did that, did your parents know? 40% said no. What that means, see, that's, that's the reality that when we encounter something scary, we tend to retreat into ourselves. We have to build relationships where it's okay when you get something scary. I know right where I'm going because I won't be condemned for bumping into the wrong thing. Those are the relationships that will allow you to have a healthy relationship with tech. Not perfect, it's not possible, there's too much stuff out there. But a healthy relationship with tech can allow you to benefit from all the great things that tech brings us, and there are so many. Like how would we have survived in COVID without the ability to connect with family and friends? I, I don't know. And it will also empower your kids to be able to have self-control. They don't need over-control, that just produces resistance. They don't need under control. Somebody needs to give some guidance. We need to teach self-control. And it will always be done through relationship. Now, after we do some questions, I've got a couple of handouts that we'll, put, we'll post. And then we'll, if we have time, we'll go through that. But what we want to do right now is kind of turn it over. And I don't know if there are any questions that have come through. But um, the questions can be from me, but especially as parents out there, if you have questions for the kids about their experiences, they have done, they, they were like, I have to talk? Like, what do I know what to say? Somebody up there will know what to say. I've talk, been around these people enough to know somebody gonna talk, because they talk, but um, do we have any questions that we want to ask the kids right now? So what if a parent blows it and they're, they like freak out is your term, right? How, how, do you, how do you regain that relationship? What would you do or what would you want your parents to do to help regain that? And let me just uh, repeat the question for the Zoom people. So the question was, if a parent blows it, like they freak out, which by the way, I think that's my term. I think they probably have some other terms. Like I think that's from my job. <laughs> do, do you just freak out? Does that work forever? Okay. So then the question is, how as a parent do you rebuild that relationship after you've had a freak out moment? It's a great question. I personally think one of the best things you can do is probably just ask for forgiveness, and that kind of leads into um, having a conversation. Because generally in those situations, there's going to be forgiveness on both sides. The child probably did something to, you know, that led to something. So yeah, like Mr. Ott touched on a lot, it's gonna come down to a conversation. And I think the best way to start that is acknowledging that there was a mistake, either on one side or both sides, and that'll lead to a good discussion about that. Are there other questions? Do we have any questions on the Zoom yet? It's hard sometimes when you get these creative pieces to start flowing before we can get to a lot of Q&A. Oh, got a question. Okay. The question is, what do you recommend for keeping healthy tech boundaries? <laughs> Um, it's going to come down to what um, each individual family needs and what each individual kid needs. So um, in terms of boundaries, I think like what Ms. Jott said about um, mutual accountability and, and kind of helping um, to create spaces where uh, like there is no tech for the parent and the child and kind of um, connecting yourself as the parent into some of the things to improve, like if you're trying to reduce time on tech, um, like improve that in yourself as well to set the example and that we're all in this together and we can. So I think something that's really important is once again to make sure what you're adding are boundaries and not restrictions. Mm. <clears throat> because 
Restrictions especially applied as an aftermeasure to an event or to an, an instance of something that happened, it doesn't really help because then it feels like a punishment. Then something that you had was taken away and it's not helpful because if anything, then what's going to happen is if something bad happens again, the last thing you're going to do is come and talk with your parents about it because then all that's going to happen is more restrictions will be added. And I think it's safe to say from literally everyone that nobody likes restrictions. But if it's mutually agreed upon and there's a base understanding that what's going on is for everyone's good, then it's a boundary and then it's helping you. Okay, to sort of piggyback off from that, um, how could we as parents support and help you as teens to make wise decisions on and to set healthy boundaries um, in the use of you know the internet and social media and just technology in general? I think part of the issue is when tech is introduced to a child with total freedom. So they don't have boundaries or restrictions because then when those boundaries are added, once again, it feels like a restriction versus if it's introduced to you and you're given a little and then added as trust is gained, then it feels like you're earning something, like you've done well and as a result, you've earned more freedom and you know where your boundaries are while they're still beneficial to you. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think um, something that's really like helpful to keep in mind are like when you're trying to help establish um, boundaries to help like your child improve with their relationship with tech um, is that I think we all like uh, teen, uh, most teens that I know, I guess, kind of know that there's an issue. I mean, we know that it's unhealthy or like the amount that they're on their phones is unhealthy and they want to improve. So I think just supporting them and letting them know that you know that they know that it's an issue and, and having those discussions about um, how it affects their life, how it affects their productivity um, and just kind of bringing it out into the open of what's going on in the current situation and then kind of you could maybe um, lead them to like resources I and mean, there is a lot out there for um, like in terms of research on habits and um, things like that to kind of improve it for themselves and give them give it to them to, to take over i guess with your guidance and support anything else you want to add to that Okay. okay, guys, you be the parent, okay? Put yourself in a parent role right now. You've got a young child at home, and they have access to anything. They're two, three, 16, I don't know. What advice do you suggest? You've seen the horrors online, all of you. It, it doesn't take much to accidentally see something you shouldn't. What do you suggest? You're the parent. Um, the biggest problem with that question is the age range. So if your child is two or three, it's pretty hard to have a conversation with your toddler. Uh, so at that point, if you're two or three year old or four or five, if it's pretty young then, and they have full access to internet, uh, that makes a little bit more sense to maybe set firmer boundaries, make sure like you're backing up on that. But if your kid is older, 12, 13, 16, 17, and they have unrestricted access, then you need to talk to them about what you think the boundaries should be and talk to them about what they think the boundaries should be because they'll at some point like um she was saying at some point like they're going to realize that this isn't healthy and also it's important to understand with an older kid they're probably going to have 
a different opinion of what the boundaries should be than you will. Uh, and that's okay. Like, just make sure you're listening to them because you as parents, a lot of the time have a platform to just talk to your kid and say what you think. But sometimes your kid just doesn't have that in the same way to be able to talk to you. So make sure that you're listening to what they're saying and maybe what their opinions are. And they're going to be different than you. That's just how it's going to work. Um, yeah, along uh, just with that also, um, like it is good to talk about going forward and like what your relationship with tech is like going forward and improving and setting boundaries. But also, I mean, if you've had a kid who um, has had unlimited access, you can talk about what they have seen and like what it has been like and like kind of what they've been exposed to up to that point. Like you can always go back and kind of check and help them through that. Like even if it was, they saw something, you know, years ago, it is never too late to kind of um, talk about that and talk through that and make sure that they um, got through that um, sometimes trauma in a sense in a healthy way. Um, I'm just going to add a tiny bit on to that just because uh, we find things on the internet as young, way too young kids, you know, and like they've never been good experiences, you know, you never stumble on something you shouldn't have seen and been like, wow, glad I saw that, you know, and so for a parent to, to come down, like, you know, in that kind of like stress, scare, like, oh, my kid just saw that, and then all of a sudden it turns into like an anger or a punishment. And it's like, yeah, we know it's like we, we shouldn't have seen that, and like, but now I'm getting in trouble. So like Mr. Rob said, we like kind of keep it to ourselves. So especially for like the age of like really growing and developing at like 10, 11, 12, and they like like what um, Elaine was saying, like go back on that and like talk and like, you know, I know um I would almost approach it as a parent, like, like an apology, like a sympathy, like, I'm so sorry you had to see something like that. I'm so sorry you stumbled upon that. Like, let's talk about that. Instead of like, you saw that, you shouldn't have seen that. It's like, no, I'm sorry you saw that. And let's talk about it. Um, but yeah. Okay. Do you have a question online? Okay. Oh, hey. Okay. Somebody wants to know, what are your thoughts? about things like Life360 or Bark or Circle programs, if these things, so, so you know what those are, but they're all different ways of parents kind of getting messages saying, hey, I think your kids seeing things they shouldn't see or whatever. Um, how do you feel about those things if they're discussed openly prior to implementing them? Um, personally, I think if you discuss it, like, before you implement it, I think that's fine. Like, as long as there's mutual agreement between the parent and the child, um, I don't really see a problem with it. Like, I would caution, though, like, if you just force your child to have it, then that would become an issue because, then, again, it feels like you're invading their privacy and things like that. But, yeah, if it's mutual, I don't see a problem. One thing, especially with like monitoring softwares and stuff, is if it isn't completely mutual, it is very much an invasion of privacy. Like it feels like you don't trust me, so you're doing this sort of thing. My experience wasn't like as extreme because it was gotten for my younger siblings and I got kind of tacked on the top end of it, but it's still, there's something about having a software that reads all of your interactions, all of your interactions with your friends, everything you say, do, gets a report sent to your parents. Something about that is just, it just grates. Like, it's very much, you don't trust me. That's just my experience. Part of that was because I wasn't really a big fan of it, but if it was completely mutually agreed upon, it probably wouldn't be that big of an issue. I think also one thing to keep in mind is when does it end for those sort of apps? Like when do you uninstall those? When is the age that, oh, now 
I can essentially trust my child. It's just another thing, like you are preparing them to be an adult. You can't always watch over their shoulder. You can't always get reports on what they're doing. So at some point, and I would say while they're still at home, that probably would need to end and you need to have those discussions with, with them and trust them. Some other questions, okay. All right, so going back to Gideon's idea of earning freedom rather than having things taken away. I have one more kid left that I get to try out who doesn't have a device yet, right? So you guys are gonna help me. When I hand her her first phone, which I keep telling her is older and older and older, right? So we're at 16 now. I know, they has got them younger in my family. What I find happens is they all got apps that I didn't even know how to use or what they were doing. So I couldn't say, you can't have this app. They were telling me about the app. So if you hand them a phone, I know there's always a setting that says you can't add new apps without permission, you know. What should I allow that 16 year old to have or that 14 year old, how old parents are? How do you start it little and let them get bigger? Because just having Google on there is like the whole world, right? Um, my suggestion would be like if this 16 year old at the time um, is just getting a new phone, maybe like have them talk with you about what apps they want to put on. That way they're the ones explaining to you like why they want it, what's the usefulness, things like that, rather than like, here are some apps you can have, but you can't have other ones. I think like one that would help the child like explain the reasonings for the apps and like the actual usefulness but also i would caution parents to be like um open-minded in the apps like sure they may not have like educational uses like you know social media instagram facebook snapchat things like that but most apps do have some sort of use that does affect the world we currently live in so that's what i would suggest I would actually say that if I had a chance, I would say um, keep your kids away from TikTok. Like, I don't know, they might love it, but it is one of the more dangerous apps. Mr. I was talking about those algorithms you can make and it is the perfect algorithm app and it, it's just very dangerous and not a happy place. So mm. yeah, like, like Nia said, there are apps, there are social media apps that are like beneficial. Some pretty amazing things have happened because of groups on Facebook or because of Instagrams and you know those kind of things or Snapchat is a fun way to talk to your friends, but I have not seen necessarily a lot of like great things come out of TikTok. Um, or you know, so if there was an app that I would encourage you not to let your kids get, it would be TikTok. Uh, TikTok is the abyss of human attention. Baby. It is. Yeah. You completely lose your ability to function. Mm -hmm. It could be and one hour or three hours and you wouldn't I, know. And you wouldn't know. And I've heard so many kids talk about this. Like they just realize, wow, I just wasted my time. But, but they know what they're doing. They're so good. They're so, so And brilliant. We're, we're brilliant as a human beings. We create really cool things for profit. And that's what it is. I'm not going to defend uh, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that because TikTok is so genius in its terms of and, um, its algorithms, other apps are um, catching on. Like Instagram has the Reels, uh, like, and I don't know what Facebook has, but it probably will have something similar. So, like, that was an advantage because now all of the other social media are going to catch on. So it's like if you limit that, I mean, it's just kind of like they all are starting to blend together and kind of have the same functions. So it's like where do you cut it off? Yeah, somebody just asked that at home. Aren't most social media platforms just as addictive? Was the question. Are most aren't most social media platforms just as addictive as TikTok? Is what this parent was asking. One thing I would say to that, like if you're looking for, I guess, boundaries or not restrictions, um, it's a lot of self reflection. Like as a teenager, I know 
how I get addicted to my phone. I know when my productivity goes down. So I would just encourage like teens, adults, like pretty much anyone who is struggling with like the amount of time I guess you have on your phone, just know like what your boundaries are for yourself. Like what will make you a healthy person because like personally, I've had to limit myself so much in order to get things done. Otherwise I could spend so much time on like apps and unnecessary things and, and like yeah so i just encourage you to focus on what is best for your health I would say. That's good. oh sally has a question yeah let me take you back on time Back when I was in college, we went to the library, we spent days, nights, weekends, living our life on the card catalog and, and uh, getting information all off of the articles. Nowadays, you don't get to appreciate that lovely social networking. Uh, it's all online. It takes, takes a lot away. Um, so I want you to appreciate what you have in your hands. What took us weeks, months to collect out of our libraries, we couldn't do it digitally. You guys have it all in your hands. Boy, my world is so simple now in comparison to college. And I've had my own children who've gone to college. How in the world did you do it? Guys, you've got this fabulous tool. Please use it to the best for your lives. Okay, let it enrich your lives, not take away. We've talked about a lot of these things. And I, I'm a fan of TikTok, but I have limits on myself. <laughs> I am. I don't put TikToks on, but I love it's my own news network. So that's how I use it for me. And uh, so I think there's nothing as far as an app horrendous out there, as long as you use it wisely. And I'm going to say our students here at MHSAP are the cream of the crop. I have not been disappointed with one that's graduated here. So continue to make us proud all of you, um, and, and use your time and your technology to honor your parents, to honor yourselves, to make your lives richer, okay? Because you've got this. Yeah. Do you have a question? A parent at home? Mm hmm So somebody at home's asking for each of you, what things have, or the question is, what convicted each of you to set up your own boundaries or let you know that you needed boundaries? I mean, you can answer that as generically or as, so I know I've seen my own students do that, my own kids at home. How do you decide that for yourself? Yeah, mine as well. Yeah. So kind of what I was talking about earlier, um, I saw my productivity go down in regards to like how much schoolwork I was getting done. Um, so that really motivated me to cut down like the time I spend on social media specifically because I was just cutting into my time um, of homework. Um, another thing I would say is I noticed, I noticed that I was really tired because um, of the effects of like, you know, screens, just like the mental effects of like just scrolling mindlessly, not really doing, like Mr. I was talking about like the constant stimulation thing. I think um, there's just too much of that in my life. So personally, I just needed to stop and focus on other things. Yeah, I think for me is when I'm mindlessly scrolling, it can really affect your mood as well. And with a lot of um, classes being online now, we're already staring at a screen for a lot more of the time than we were. And so when you go from screen to another screen, it kind of dumbs your mind, I think, to you just sort of feel like a fog brain. So. For me personally, I realized I was getting a lot less schoolwork done, and by the end of the day, I'd be like, wow, I don't have time to, you know, read or draw or do the other things that I like to do. And so just realizing that I could be doing more productive things with my life instead of, like the other said, just like scrolling mindlessly, I wanted to set some boundaries so I could get those things done. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say anything really different. <laughs> it definitely comes down to productivity. And also, like Nelly said, I mean, you feel it. You feel like the fog brain. You feel like in a daze. And um, after like 
just looking at a screen for so long. And for me, I definitely could tell I was being like overly stimulated. And I mean, I already like think so much in my brain. So it was just like too much going on internally and then flooding more things in um, from like the digital world. And so I just needed more quiet because it was just so much noise. And so I, that's why I turned it down. And I actually got, um, for a while I had an app um, that tracks your time, like you can put it in yourself, like different categories of what you're doing, and then it tracks for how long you're doing that. And you can just like push start and stop. And so that really helped me to see, just to kind of lay the groundwork of what exactly I'm spending my time on. And then from there, I was able to um, more better or be able to improve like my productivity and everything because I knew. Um, how long things took me, how much I was wasting on my phone, things like that. So, what's the name of that? Uh, I think it's just Time Tracker. I don't know if you pull it off. <laughs> because and I hate to pull up my phone while I'm talking about it. It's called Now. <laughs> it's called Now Then. Um, I think there's like a paid version of Google. Anyway, it was really helpful. <laughs> I've always really loved going outside. And I think when I noticed like, oh, I'm missing, you know, the sunset or whatever, because I was on social media, um, is when I like realized where I was missing out, I guess, when you spend too much time on there. And so I have uh, multiple timers on social media apps that I have. I don't really have any game apps. Um, that is one thing, like social media is good for, you know, keeping up with your friends and seeing what people have here around the world are doing um, that you can't talk to. But kind of limiting your time to just catching up, not going to the, you know, TikTok side or not like scrolling through things that aren't really relevant. Um, but yeah, I think also for younger kids, just taking them outside and kind of giving them a love for something else other than just their phone or just something else like reading. I think that can be really good. Yeah, I mean, again, schoolwork is a big indicator for me like my, I'm not doing as well in my grades, or I'm just not getting as much stuff done. That's a big thing. Uh, another thing that was a huge motivator for me was realizing, like, I'm spending all this time online, and I have these big goals that I want to achieve, and I could be spending time working towards those goals and aspirations, and instead I'm sitting here wasting my time, and I know I'll regret it later. So that was that's a really big indicator for me. So I'm last, so I'm probably just going to recap what everyone else was saying in kind of a long-winded way. So <laughs> it was my sophomore year, and for some reason, I just didn't have as much school as I had had previous years. And something had to fill the void. Like before that, I was kind of your, your stereotypical homeschool child. Like I read four hours a day. I spent a bunch of time outside with my family. And for some reason, I don't remember why, we had this almost like a tablet thing, but like way cheaper. It had access to the internet and YouTube. And my parents just kind of forgot it existed and it lived under my pillow. I think to this day, they still did not know the sheer amount of time I spent in that thing. Like every Sunday night at three in the morning, I'd have this like weird melancholy feeling and I'd be like, next week I'm gonna actually do stuff. And then I wake up, it's Monday morning, and I'm perfectly happy to waste time again. And it just went like that the entire year. Until finally, I don't remember what it was. I think it's when I'd gone previous to this. See, I was like one of the best readers at the library. I always completed the whole little track in the uh, middle school section. But that year, I, did, I read nothing, literally nothing. And it was this weird... It was like some core aspect of what I had always seen myself as had changed. And I don't remember why, but I just kind of stopped. I still don't know how I managed to do it. I'm kind of glad I did, but uh, yeah. Wow. Cool. <laughs> I think as we get to the end here, that we, um, let me say a few words and then we have some other questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Gideon, I'm going to answer in a long winded way. Son, I taught you everything I know. <laughs> You're good. You can take over now. Like, just keep talking. It's just, that was great. You guys were good. Like, this was stunning. Like, I, I hope you guys appreciate, first of all, the courage that, for them to do this, like, just basically be out there on Zoom land. Like, who knows what is really going on out there. 
Um, I, I kind of want to just address a couple things, and, and maybe it's only one. First of all, the, the handouts are going to be posted right now, and you can go and fetch those right now. I'm going to talk about a couple of those things. But the most important one, I think, that I want to mention is when you start talking about boundaries, I can't encourage enough physical boundaries for tech. And by that specifically, and this has been a problem I've been seeing for a number of years, not just with phones, there should be no tech in your bedroom, period. Now I used to tell this story about how when I started working as a school psychologist, everybody I knew had a television set. And some of them had this box and you could take these giant cassette tapes and you put it into the box and it would play movies. Okay, now it's not uncommon and I would say it's probably almost true. Every family I know has a television in every room that a human is in. And a lot of times kids are not able, and I'm talking younger kids in this group, kids can't go to sleep without their tech. That's dangerous. That's just dangerous. Now, the thing is, if you're gonna make some rules about the physical boundaries for tech, they go for everybody. And there need to be tech-free spaces and there need to be tech-free times, but it's true for everybody in the family and it should be negotiated. Now, some kids just, just said, he was doing so good. And then he went into the bedroom, like don't touch the phone. Here's the thing. When you have tech in the bedroom, it is delaying you from getting to sleep. And a lot of times it's interrupting your sleep in the middle of the night. And this is happening with a lot of people. So I appreciated getting, bringing this up. It's like, ah, I kept the YouTube under my, under my pillow. Like th this should be an early rule that there's tech free zones. Now, one of the ways that you can help with the monitoring of what kids do on tech as they're younger and getting older is we only use tech in these rooms. And there is no go someplace and hide and do tech. In other words, you can't go and have a secret tech life, but you can have a life that's in front of everybody that nobody ever looks like at. And, and this has to be worked out in your family, but the data on what sleep deprivation does to kids and to adults is, is pretty alarming. And so if you want some antidotes for mental health problems, there's kind of three or four really good things that you can do if you want to be mentally healthy. Number one, eat food. Like not little Debbie's. What do you guys, they're always making you bring stupid little Debbie's. They're terrible for you. How can you, I'm glad, you're, I'm glad you did not see their reaction because <laughs> I'm always the one that brings little Debbie's. Eat food, not junk, okay? Drink water, not sugar. Get, every teenager should be getting at least seven hours of sleep a night. Now, some are doing 10 hours of sleep. <laughs> That's a whole other issue. But everyone should be getting seven hours. What I was finding out is that a lot of teenagers were maybe getting seven hours over the course of 10 or 12 hours, but they were up and responding to the pains. If you have an early rule that just says, the phones sleep out here, they don't sleep in there, it will alleviate a ton of stress. On people. Getting good sleep, in fact, is one of the things on the, on the uh, handout here. It's one of the things, getting good sleep. It's so, so important. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was the whole thing of privacy versus secrecy. So when Amy Crouch, who's the daughter of Andy Crouch, wrote My Tech Wise Life, she wrote about this issue and how important it is that we have a difference between secrets and privacy. As kids go through their teenage years, it is their job to develop a life independent of the adults. Like they, you don't want them to constantly be under your supervision with every dot, jot and tittle of the law. It's not going to work. First of all, it's not going to work because they're smarter than you. Second of all, it's not going to work because you're not teaching them the skills they actually need. Like, don't you want your kids to be able to make these decisions themselves? And a focus that doesn't allow privacy creates secrecy. This will happen. If kids don't have privacy with their tech, 
they will develop secrets. And that creates division in the relationship. There's got to be a balance. There ha and that's only going to come through conversation. So this is what Amy said in her book on page 100. If you get the book, go get the book. Um, it's on this sheet here. You can look it up. Uh, my tech was like, she says this, the sad result of not enough privacy is secrecy. Some people I know change their passcodes constantly, clear their browser history, and even hide their devices so their parents won't snoop. Because they aren't allowed any privacy, they resort to deception to gain some privacy back. It's legit. Like this is a, this is a tightrope. And as I said at the very beginning, when we're afraid, we go to legalism or fatalism. We gotta go to self-control, not over control, not under control. The issue of privacy is going to be a really important one. Um, another resource on here, if, especially with older teens, like younger teens, are, their eyes literally will scroll back in their heads. They will not be able to track with this, but older kids, high school kids. Um, if you haven't watched it, watch The Social Dilemma, which was released in November. Social Dilemma is on uh, Netflix. It's put out by basically a whole bunch of former tech executives who just kind of give you the lowdown on what's up. And a lot of them are saying things, which we already know, they don't let their kids do this. Like they, and younger kids, but they don't let their kids get access to tech very quickly because they know how it works. This will help you to see how it works. It is one-sided, it's trying to make a point, but the guy that put it together has a website, which is right across on your sheet here called Humane Tech. And it's not, it is not, by the way, just to identify that we have this in, in, in the house, it is not a faith-based website. It's written by, um, like, like I said, guys who basically said, we don't want to be a part of this anymore because in the end, what we thought was good is turning into a disaster. At one point, the guy that's one of the inventors of the like button on Facebook, he said, we just thought we were trying to spread positive feelings. We had no idea how addictive that, addictive that would be for some people. So it's not that there was bad intent, but now this thing is with the TikTok algorithms, the point that yeah, all the social media works the same way. It's absolutely true. You have to know what you're doing. So watch the social dilemma together because the other thing I'm gonna say about this and then I'll be done is, no, because I have one more thing to say. Is, is like, um, what was I going to say? There's a lot of good information out there. One of the best things you can do with tech is use tech to research tech. Spend some time talking together about what you learn individually and as a family about tech. Watch the social dilemma. Get these books. They're good. This Barna is a Christian group. So for those of you that are oriented towards faith, this is a, this is a great resource for you because it deals with faith life as well as with tech. Uh, the Barna books are great, um, but learn things and share what you learn, not in, a, not in a gotcha way. Guess what I heard? If you spend eight more minutes on tech than you're spending right now, you end up, you know, your hair turns green. Like, don't share stuff like that in a threatening way, but in a way that says, what do you think about this? I just read this article. What do you think? And then encourage researching this, coming to your own decisions. Your kids are capable of making really good choices. Are they going to make them every time? Did you? Like, is that the standard? 100% getting it right? I'm thankful that I'm not held to that standard, especially in Easter time. I can say that. I'm not supposed to talk about that stuff, but I'm just saying I'm grateful that there's grace and mercy for the times when I stumble. And that needs to be something we fold into this conversation because it's scary. Sometimes we lose sight of the relationship. Uh, the last thing I want to say is this iGen thing is direct quotes from uh, the iGen book, which is all about technology. It's pretty parent heavy, um, but read through it. Uh, it's, it has some very direct kinds of things. It may be a little over the top, depending on your per perspective, but the book itself has a lot of really good information and is well worth reading. It is a bit scary, and I don't want to recommend it and say, I'm trying to scare you. This isn't about being scared. It's about getting information and helping us make good decisions. All right, this has been brilliant. Uh, the, the kids were so good. I talked way too long. I didn't know they'd be that brilliant. I knew they were brilliant. I didn't that good. 
Um, we are going to be together again in two weeks, but um, I'm just going to sign off at this point. Christopher, thank you so much for what you did. Uh, Gentlemen's going to make a couple announcements for student council, and then we'll call it a night. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.